Welcome to episode 10 of Michael Reads from Book. Today we're going to get all classic up in it with Virgil's The Aeneid. This is the Penguin's classic edition, and we'll be reading right from the beginning with book one. When I find it. Right. I am the poet who in times past made the light melody of pastoral poetry. In the next poem, I left the woods for the adjacent farmlands, teaching them to obey even the most exact tillers of the soil, and the farmers liked my work. But now I turn to the terrible strife of Mars. This is the tale of arms and of a man. Fated to be an exile, he was the first to sail from the land of Troy and reach Italy at its Levantian shores. He met many tribulations on the way, both by land and on the sea. High heaven willed it, though Juno was ruthless and could not forget her anger. And he had also to endure great suffering in warfare. But at last he succeeded in founding his city and instilling the gods of his race in the Latin land. And that was the origin of the Latin nation, the lords of Alba, and the proud battlements of Rome. I pray for inspiration to tell how it all began, and how the Queen of Heaven sustained such outrage to her majesty that in her indignation she forced a man famed for his true-heartedness to tread that long path of adventure, and to face so many trials. It is hard to believe gods in heaven capable of such rancor. Once there was an ancient town called Carthage, inhabited by emigrants from Tyre, and confronting Italy, opposite to the power of the Tiber but far away. Carthage had wealth and power. It had skill and ferocity in battle. Now Juno is said to have loved Carthage best of all the cities in the world, giving even Samos the second place. She kept her weapons and her chariots there, and he had, she had already set her heart on making a capital city governing all the earth, and she spared no effort of fostering care, hoping that destiny might consent to her desire. She had, however, heard of another breed of man, tracing descent from the flood of Troy, who were one day to overthrow this Tyrian stronghold, for they would breed a warrior nation, haughty and sovereign over wide realms, and their onset would bring destruction to Africa. Such she had heard was the planning of the spinning fates, and it was this plan that Juno feared. Neither could she forget the Trojan War, where she had battled in the forefront of the Argos which she loved. She remembered the origin of that quarrel and the fierce indignation which it had caused her, the judgment of Paris, with its unslight, unjust slight to her beauty, remained indelibly stamped on her mind. And besides, she was always jealous of the Trojan race, and could not forget how Ganymede had been stolen and honored. Such were the causes of Juno's fury, and so it was that the Trojan remnant, who the Greeks, even pitiless Achilles, could not kill, were tossed in storm over all the ocean, and still she kept them far from Latium, wandering for years at the mercy of fate from sea to sea about the world. Such was the cost and heavy toil of beginning the life of Rome. The Trojans had put to sea from Sicily. They were just out of the sight of land, the bronze plate oars churning the salt water to foam, and they were happily hoisting sail when Juno, perpetually nursing her heart's deep wound, spoke to herself. I vanquished? I to abandon the fight? Lacking even the strength to keep Troy's prince from making Italy? The fates forbid me indeed. Yet they never stopped Minerva from gutting the Argives fleet by fire and drowning all of them merely because one man, Ajax, son of Willis, he alone went mad and sinned. She borrowed Jupiter's devouring fire and sped it from the clouds. She shattered the ships and tore up the surface of the earth of ocean with winds. And when Ajax, pierced through the breast by the lightning flame, was breathing his last breath, she caught him up under a tornado and impaled him on a pointed rock. Yet I, in my stately presence, queen of all the divine, I, the sister and wife of Jove, have been making war for all these years on a single clan. Will anyone pay reverence to Juno's majesty? Or lay his humbling, his offering on her altar in humble prayer? Debating so with herself in her fiery brain, she went straight to Eolia, where the storm clouds have their home and mad winds are bursting to be free. In the great spaces of a cavern they wrestle, and hurricanes roar, 
but Aeolus, the king who rules them, confines them in their prison, disciplined and curbed. They race from door to bolted door, and all the mountain reverberates with the noise of their resentment. But Aeolus, throned securely above them, scepter in hand, tempers their arrogance and controls their fury. Otherwise they would sleep violently away from them every land, every sea, and the very depths of the sky, and drive them all through space. There's like an echo here of that uh, short story, The Wind That Came From Nowhere, my short story and novel. Yeah. Ah. Foreseeing this, therefore, the father with whom all is with whom is all power banished the winds to the dark cavern, and piled above them a mountain mass, appointed a king over them who under a fixed charter would know how to hold them confined, and also when so commanded to give them free reign. To this king of the winds, Juno now made her submissive appeal. And that concludes another edition of Michael Reads from a Book. Thanks for listening.